ASMR for you there for uh, the intro to episode five. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Positive Reinforcement. Um, hope you're doing well. I've got a lot more energy this week than I did last week, so we're going we're gonna to be firing on all cylinders today, for sure. Got my LaCroix back. We got Cran Raspberry today. Um, so I'm going to get burpee pretty quick. Hope everyone's having a good week. Um, you might be wondering why I'm wearing a tie. I usually don't uh, get all dressed up like this, but had to do a presentation this morning. Um, somehow, some way, my uh, PLC just expected me to do it. So I did it. And uh, you know what, dude? I'm not even mad. I'm not even upset. I took it like a champ, and I went up there, and I killed it to be honest. I went up there. I started off, I said some weird stuff that I remember. I, you know, when you're, when you're nervous and you go up in front of a group of people and you practice constantly and you don't do anything that you practiced <laughs> and you're wondering as you're talking, I didn't say any of this while I was practicing. What's this new stuff that's coming out? That's kind of like what was happening this morning while I was giving the presentation. But the stuff that I was saying instead, still just as good. It looks like I'm peeking a lot. It sounds, it looks, no, I think we're good with the volume. Am I too loud? Who cares? If I am, it's going to be this way the entire episode. Anyway, so quick update with who took the terror. Uh, let's, let's bring it back down here. Let's, let's um, curb the energy for a second and, and get serious. The terror is still missing. We still don't know who took it. Mr. Bell said he would uh, keep an eye out, as all of us are doing. We're all keeping an eye out for the terror, but we have not found it. We had a substitute the other day. We went into the Men of 300 bathroom, and there was a book sitting on the nightstand, and I got a little excited. I was like, ooh, it's not the terror, but maybe it's something new, something exciting. Um, but it was there was some substitute in the bathroom, and it was his book, and he just set it down on the nightstand like he owns the place or something. Um, so there is no no terror. No terror has been returned in the nightstand. All we have right now is the, the picture of the cat and the dog. So we're still looking for the terror. Um, we're still spreading this hashtag around. Who took the terror? Let's go. Let's do something about it because we got to build up that nightstand. I'm going to Target today after work. Um, I'm going to look for another lamp for the nightstand. So will we find one? We'll see. We'll find out. Uh, so this presentation I did this morning, it was pretty fun. Um, it's always nerve-wracking. I mean, seven years in, I don't get that nervous anymore when it comes to talking in front of the kids that nervousness has definitely kind of went to the side. Um, but anytime I get up and I'm in a room full of adults who are also doing the same job that you do, many of them having much more experience than you do, and you're trying to present about something that is so like teacher-y, like for instance, we were talking about CASP, and CASP is the state test that we take every single year to determine, you know, the entire school's English and math proficiency levels, kind of a big deal. But the presentation was about how we're going to improve our English scores. So it's kind of a, a stressful presentation, but uh, it's always kind of weird being up there and you see like the 18 year teachers, shout out to Mr. Stocks, or the teachers who've been doing it for, you know, so long. And you're up there trying to like, this is what I'm doing that's right. Listen to me. It's, it's weird for sure. It's like when um, you have a student teacher who's older than you. It's like, it's like when you're a college student, right? And you're the typical age, you know, 19, 20, 21. And you see someone in your college class who's like 85 and they've never opened a book before and it's the first time that they're getting an education. I applaud those people. I mean, should you have started earlier? Yes. Um, are you knocking on death's door? Obviously. 
Um, should you have made the decision to turn your life around at 30, possibly 40? Definitely. Um, will you be able to accomplish your goals? Probably not because you'll be in the ground. Um, but I still applaud you for um, attempting, you know, just try to do it a little bit earlier. There's always time to turn it around. Who cares about societal expectations? If you're a 65-year-old woman, 65-year-old dude, whatever, and you want to get a degree in liberal arts or whatever, do it. Just do it when you're 45, not 65. Um, so invent a time machine or something like that. Anyway, um, so where's my agenda? Here we go. Um, oh, yeah. So this is something I want to talk about. It might sound boring when I say what the topic is, but give me a shot. Give me a chance to make it entertaining. I want to talk about teachers and their late work policies. Um, meaning, when students turn in late work, how are they punished? What kind of points are they going to get in return for turning in something that's a day late or a week late, et cetera, et cetera? Um, I, I mean, really, the whole point of high school is to try as much as possible to emulate real life, right? So with my late work policy, I want to make it as close to having the same experience at the DMV as possible. So what I do with my late work policy, I have this clipboard where, okay, first of all, let me break this down. Students can turn in assignments two different ways. Hard copy, meaning, you know, doing it the old school way, pencil to paper, or <laughs> burpee number one. Or they can turn it in digitally to Google Classroom. Um, so they can do the assignment, you know, with Google Docs or Google Slides or Adobe Spark or whatever program they're using and turn it in digitally. Um, when they turn it in digitally, I don't get any kind of notification. Can I receive notifications? Oh, you bet. I can turn it on real quick and I can get emails every time a student turns in something late. But I don't want to get my emails flooded with a bunch of procrastinators and kids failing to do their job. No. Emails for um, the urgent, let's take care of this right now kind of stuff. And if you're not on time, you're not on time. So I turn off the notifications. So this is what they have to do if they turn in late work. They turn it in, then they have to come and fill out this clipboard that I have on the counter in my classroom. They have to fill out their name, they have to fill out their class period, they have to thoroughly explain what the assignment is that they turned in, and they have to tell me where they turned it in. Did they turn it in as a, a paper assignment? Did they turn it in as a digital assignment? I need to know these things. And I, they need to fill in the date. Um, just as a joke, I want to have them like fill out their address and their zip code and provide their email address and, and stuff like that. But um, it's, it's so close to the DMV, it makes me laugh every time a grading period is about to end. Because when they're turning in work right before the grading period is over, the line to the clipboard almost goes out the door on the Friday before a grading period is over. And I laugh to myself every single time. They are losing time from their weekend because they did work too late. And they're trying to scramble. They're trying to turn it in. Most of the time, it's not done correctly. So are they being deducted points? No, not because of being late. But they are being deducted points because it's not done correctly because they didn't give themselves enough time to get it done right in the window of time that I originally gave them, which is enough time to get the assignment done in the first place. Stop being lazy. That's the bottom line, okay? Any of my students listening right now, stop being lazy. Any of my students from the past who are listening right now, I hope that you're shaking your head yes. Yeah, don't be lazy. Turn it in. Otherwise, we've got to fill in that stupid clipboard. Soon enough, I'm going to be forcing you to, you know, give me proof of residency and give me two copies of your social security number and your ID and um, all that in order to get the points. I'm also I'm also going to have uh, those red things with the numbers that you got to pull out. So when they come in to sign the clipboard, 
I want to have them take a number, and I'll, I'll have a little like cheap PA system set up, and I'll just be sitting there like, K27, you may now step up to the missing work clipboard to fill out any work that you're missing and deliberately wait 20 minutes before I call the next number and just have a little quasi waiting room stationed in my classroom. I'm so going to do that. Take a number. Making the experience just as painful and dull as possible just because you did not turn your work in on time. That's genius. That's genius. Not just a hat rack, my friend. All right. So late work policies. Pretty fun. They can be pretty fun. If you make kids have to do tedious, boring stuff like fill out paperwork, they're going to do their work on time. So make it real life, people. That's what we want to do. Make it like real life. Um, when I write the agendas for my podcasts, I, I add stuff to it all the time or I'll take away stuff throughout the week. I, I see this note here that I wrote maybe three days ago, probably on Sunday. I wrote, I don't feel like doing this podcast today as, a, as something to talk about. Um, that's not true. On Sunday, I had a feeling, man, I'm not going to want to film the podcast. I just feel like I'm not going to be in the mood. But here I am, and I'm in the mood, and I'm making it. Um, what's funny that I noticed, students are requesting the podcast more than any teachers are, more than any adults are. Uh, it's so funny. My present students right now are like, are you going to put that on the podcast, Mr. Norris? Hey, you're going to put that podcast out today, Mr. Norris? It's so hilarious. It's not for you guys. <laughs> it's for teachers. But I'm happy that you find entertainment out of it. Um, I had one of my students from a couple years ago. She came by and, and said, I have this list of podcasts that I listen to all the time, and I added yours to it. You're one of my favorites. And that was so cool. I, I wonder if she wants to be a teacher. You know what? I feel like I remember her saying that when she was in my class. I might be wrong, but that makes a little bit more sense. But regardless, it's cool that students like to listen. You know, maybe this podcast will make a student want to be a teacher. Who knows? If you haven't noticed, I'm super inspirational. I'm really, really good at what I do. Uh, and humility is my strongest trait by far. Okay. Um... This isn't part of the agenda, but I'm just currently excited about this right now. Exclusive for any Jedman Fish fans who are watching. By the way, if you're watching, please subscribe. Let's keep this family growing, right? I talked last week about my YouTube analytics. Basically, they... How does this look? They're going down. The For this podcast specifically, every week, the views and the likes are going down. And is that going to stop me from making it? No. But... Is a little dis discouraging, sure, um, but this the whole point of this podcast is to make the family grow and to reach out to as many people as possible. Share it, do what you got to do. Anyway, <laughs> sorry about that. LaCroix, it's LaCroix's fault. It's LaCroix, all right? It's not LaCroix, it's LaCroix. Honestly, I don't even know if it's LaCroix. What am I talking about? Um, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah. Exclusive news right here. So those of you who are subscribed to my channel are likely subscribed because of the Lord of the Flies audiobook. That is my magnum opus, I guess, on my, my YouTube channel. And thank you so much for subscribing. Thank you so much for listening. Those videos are surpassing nearly 30,000 views now, which is pretty surreal to look at. Um, Hey, Lord of the Flies is the best book of all time. It, it deserves to be out there. Um, anyway, so speaking of audiobooks, I've been tossing around the idea of what to do next. And Mr. Bacon, we all know Mr. Bacon. Really quick, let's do a status update here. Let's see if he's on. Uh, <laughs> he is. He is on. Just in case, I'll turn the volume up in case he wants to ding me. 
Ding City, baby. You're, look, you're looking at the mayor of Ding City right here. He's just, he wishes he were the mayor. Now, he's just a, he just works for like the Parks and Rec Department. He's not the mayor. You're not the mayor. What movie is that from? I put it down below and I'll give you a shout out. You're not the mayor. What is that? Um, anyway, Mr. Bacon, just a few minutes ago, uh, brought up the idea of an audiobook for the Greek play Medea, Greek mythology. And uh, it's one of the stories that we do toward the end of the first semester. And it's always one that we feel we like it. It's very entertaining. There's lots of drama and just awesome parts. But we always kind of consider it the weaker link in the world lit repertoire of stories. So we were thinking of a way to kind of spice things up and it would be super cool to make an audio book for Medea. And uh, it's a Greek, uh, Greek mythology play from a long time ago, but it's so... It's already so relevant. Uh, it, long story short, you know what? I'm not going to spoil anything because some of my students might be watching this. But the things that happen in that play happen today. And so that's one of the reasons why we've been keeping it around and, and still rooting for it because there's lots, lots to unpack in that play. But it's a very dry kind of experience with reading it. Um... And it's so explosive of a play, especially toward the end. It would be really cool to have the music and the sound effects and really hear that drama. There's a there's a recorded play version that exists, but I've never seen it. And, and Mr. Bacon just swears it's the most boring thing on earth. So I'm not going to touch it. But if we can make Medea really cool and come to life with an audiobook, I think that'd be awesome. So that's our next project. We're, we're, we're aiming to get that done maybe in November. So if you're into Greek mythology, this one's for you. I'm not sure if Medea is at all popular with other schools. It's not like a Lord of the Flies or a To Kill a Mockingbird, you know? It's not one of those staples in most schools' curriculum. But All right, so we're excited about making Medea. We're going we're gonna to try to get the entire PLC to do some, some voiceover acting on it. So it's not just me the whole time. Um, where's my agenda? There it is. All right. Um, yeah, so we're excited about that. I swear to God, if I'm not... Okay, we're still recording. Good. All right. Um, got my tickets for Joker yesterday. Um, we're going to see it, my wife and I and a couple of friends, we're going to see it on the 5th of October. And, oh, my gosh, I can't wait. Can't wait. All right, so here's my next serious topic I want to talk about. Um, feeling uninspired. I was feeling that really, really bad on uh, last weekend. It was hard to wake up on Monday, even though Monday I didn't even teach. Monday was a, a day where we all met as a PLC to just do some work. So I wasn't even in the classroom. But it was still kind of difficult to wake up um, because I was thinking of the rest of the week and the assignments that we were going to do. And I was just not feeling the assignments. Um, and when you feel that, you've got to do something about it. Otherwise, you're going to go into your classroom feeling uninspired. <laughs> and that's all I can say about that. So when I say do something about it, sorry. The quad is attacking me pretty bad right now. So let's have another drink, huh? Anyway, um, when you're feeling uninspired with your lessons or uh, anything in the classroom, you've got to find a way to fix it. Don't just 
be like, well, I guess it's just going to be an off day and go into it. You're going to, no, you're, you're going to feel even worse after that day is over. Figure out a way to be inspired by it. You've got to work to feel that inspiration. Inspiration, yes, it does kind of conjure itself sometimes, but you got to work to earn that inspiration sometimes, especially when you're a teacher, because the second you're uninspired, your kids don't give a crap about what you have to say. So keep that in mind. Let me give an example. So there's an assignment we're doing right now called an idiom hunt. Um, they look up 40 of the most common idioms used in our culture. They have to define what its true meaning is, and they have to look up the origins of where all of these idioms come from. Um, I think it's, it's not the most exciting lesson by any means, but it's, I think it's useful because these, these idioms are used a lot every day by everyday people. And sometimes students don't know what these idioms mean. So, you know, when they leave high school and they come into contact with someone that uses a lot of idioms all the time, Mr. Bacon, um, you know, let's just call a spade a spade. <laughs> you want to know what these idioms mean. And uh, so I find it useful in that regard. Anyway, I just wasn't feeling inspired with how to find a way to get students to connect with idioms. It's idioms. It's not really exciting. So that's what was making me like, man, I'm not looking forward to doing the idiom hunt. And I don't want to just try to come up with something brand new. How can I make the idiom hunt work? So I sat down and I thought about it. And I was thinking of times when idioms came into my life. And I thought about one time in particular, I was in college and I was eating dinner at the Olive Garden and I had a waiter that came up to me to give me the check. And in my head, I'm thinking, I'm going to say thank you, but maybe I'm going to be more casual and say thanks. This is the debate I'm having with myself in my head as he's handing me the check. When he gives me the check, what comes out of my mouth is this, thank and he turned around and walked away all confused. I felt like an idiot. I did not want to leave the restaurant with that waiter thinking that I was that dumb and just said thank like some weirdo. So I you know, just kind of walked up to him and said, I said thank, I meant to say thank you. It's kind of weird, I just wanted to clear the air. And he said, um, oh yeah, yeah, no, no, it's water under the bridge. And he turned around and walked away. And I had no idea what water under the bridge meant. <laughs> I was well into my adult life. I just never came across that idiom. It's water under the bridge, meaning it's the past. It's insignificant. It doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. So now I'm even more upset. I said, thank. I don't know what water under the bridge meant. Is he insulting me? I don't know. Um, is he gonna? Is he a part of a, a Italian mafia, and he's gonna kill me later and make my body float in the water and disappear forever? I don't know. I don't know what he's trying to tell me. So he turns and walks away, super menacing, and I am just left like this is the worst night of my life talking to this Olive Garden waiter, all because I didn't understand what the idiom meant. And when I thought of that story, I was like, bam, there's my inspiration, and I got excited. And I told the story before the idiom um, assignment was given out. Students laughed, had a good time, and they went right into the lesson. I felt way better about it, and I created inspiration. So whenever you feel like you're about to deliver a lesson and you just don't have the gumption or the inspiration, find a way to be inspired. Find a way to connect to it. Otherwise, you've got to abandon it, or you just got to swallow the fact that you're going to suck for a couple of days if you don't do anything about it. So create the inspiration for yourself. Um, and usually the go-to is a personal story from your life that connects to whatever you're trying to teach or whatever you're trying to do. That's what I found. Um, man, this episode is flying by, man. We're already at 25 minutes. Although that time might be different because the microphone randomly disappeared again this episode. Um, I'll close with this today. 
next week, it's going to be weird. Last year was the first time I did this, and it was a great experience. Um, I wrote a full-on novel, and I wrote a short story that was published last year, and I taught the short story in a unit, like reading my own stuff with my students. It was so strange. I know I joke about being like really good at what I do and all that, but in all honesty, I do believe um, I'm good at what I do, and if I didn't think that, I wouldn't do it. Um, I, I feel like I'm a pretty strong writer, and I felt like, wow, this story really does fit with our transformation unit. I wonder if I could include it and teach it. Would that be too much? And I went back and forth with myself, and I decided, you know what? I think my students might have a good time with that, knowing that their teacher wrote the thing that they're studying. We'll find out. And man, they absolutely loved it. It was such a cool experience. And they weren't afraid to, to be critical. You know, they weren't afraid to throw out their ideas as far as like what things symbolize and what, they, what, they, what things, um, how they think certain uh, scenes are going to go. Like, it was such a, such a cool experience. And I'm doing that again next week. And uh, it's, I'm always nervous about it. I was super nervous about it last year. Even though it went really well, I'm still on edge about doing it. Um, so hopefully I'll have a similar experience to last year with uh, teaching my short story with um, the students. And I'm working on a sequel right now, which is even more surreal of an experience. The students that I had last year, dozens have either messaged me or come into my room and asked, when is the sequel going to be done? Like they're so excited to, to read it. Anytime a student is excited to read something, you're doing something right as an educator. Because reading more and more so is just falling by the wayside for these students as a pastime. Every now and then you'll get lucky and you'll have some students that just love to read, but more often than not, you're not going to come across it. So to have so many students come back and ask me, when is your sequel to your short story going to be done? It's just uplifting. Um, I've been focusing on a lot of music lately, but as the weather cools down and you know we're getting snuggly in our blankets and we got our hot cocoa and all that, it definitely puts me more into the writing mood. So I'll definitely get to work on it probably later this fall for sure. Um, and hey, the audiobook for Copacetic, my short story, recorded by Tobuscus, name drop. I'm going to name drop that all day. Toby Turner, uh, really cool experience. He was asking for people to submit their short stories to him. I sent him mine. He wrote me back interested in the story. And he recorded a full-on audiobook for my short story. And uh, it's like an hour long. And I went back and I put music and sound effects to it. It's on my channel if you want to check it out. Um, so really cool, surreal experience watching one of my favorite YouTubers, you know, interacting with him and talking about ideas and, and him recording this. It was very cool. Um, so Toby, thanks a lot, man. It means a lot. Anyway, I think that's it. Once again, I received no questions. I'm telling you people, I got to share my wisdom. I need my experience to come out to you. Ask me questions about teaching. Ask me questions about anything that I can help you with in your life. Please. When I made my scares of student teacher, scares of student teaching videos years ago, I got so many questions and comments on those videos. So what am I doing wrong? I don't know. Um, but keep them coming. Hopefully the more of these I make, the more the videos and the podcasts will get out there and the more people will see them and start to ask questions. So just got to be patient, you know? But not as patient as an 85-year-old deciding to go to college because likely you're going to be in the ground 
before you get a degree? Um, I think that's about it, guys. Yeah, I'm all done. We're over 30 minutes, at least on on according to this time. But that's it. This was a fun one. Um, decorations will be up next week. October is on Tuesday, and then there'll be decorations up. So it's going to be a little bit of a different setup for sure. Um, I know what I'm going to be for Halloween, and Halloween's on a Thursday this year, so I will be recording the podcast in my Halloween costume. Cannot wait for that. Um, so you'll be surprised. The new Blink-182 album is out. It's called Nine. It's pretty good. It's not their best. It's not their worst. Um, it's different. Check it out if you're a Blink fan. Um, Chargers play the Dolphins on Sunday. So if the Chargers lose to the Dolphins, I'm going to hang myself. So this might be the last episode. Anyway, thank you very much. We'll see you next week unless the Chargers lose to the Dolphins. Thank you very much. Love you all. Goodbye.